Thank you, everyone. So thank you, everyone, for this session uh, that we're going to have on SEEU, uh, Southeast European University in the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, and so I think the speakers are ready to engage with us. Uh, and we are also streaming in Facebook, uh, in the Teacher Education Intersection Facebook Live. And so thank you, everyone, for being here. It is so lovely to see you all here setting aside invaluable invalu time to have this discussion with us. And so I, let me do a quick introduction, and then you guys can you know, take off from there. We have Professor Veronica Kareva, uh, who's our lead speaker today. And we have uh, Professor Daniela, uh, and the, Daniela Kirovska, <laughs> all right? Yes. Also from uh, Southeast European University. We have Professor Dimitrieska from uh, who, Indiana University. And we have Professor Zlatkotska from Indiana University. University, University of Southern Indiana. <laughs> Southern Indiana. USA. I know, it's all these acronyms. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but it's lovely to have all of you here. So let's just begin our roundtable discussions. And, um, and so the object of the discussion today is that we're trying to celebrate the research and the undertakings of teacher educators uh, in the countries from which uh, in, in which they work. And, and so the focus at this point in time uh, are the two articles that are co-authored by Professor, um, Professor Kareva as well as Professor Kirovska. And so the, and we're going to talk about blended and online uh, teaching and learning in Southeast European University or SEEU. And, you know, and we're going to, you know, start, however, with discussions in terms of um, higher education, language teaching in the Republic of North Macedonia. But before I, I, before I start, um, Professor Kareva, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that, that you do in um, SEU and, and link that up to the, uh, the university uh, itself, uh, the setting and why it's there, because it's a relatively new university. It's in two, it was established in 2001. So if you want to take from, take us, uh, you know, into your world, that'd be great. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pawan, for inviting us to join this discussion. It's a very um, great opportunity to be able to talk to you and share experiences with you, with an expert uh, of your caliber. And it's very nice to get in touch with our two colleagues whom we miss very much, not only as friends, but also because of, of their experience in, in teaching because we used to work together and uh, that's why we know what, what we miss now since they have left, both of them. Amy first and then Vesna and then um, we still live with the memories that they left behind. So um, I work as um, an English teacher. I started my career at SEU as a language teacher at the language center and slowly as the time progressed uh, mainly due to the um, education and uh, exchange program with IU school of education um, then i got more and more involved with uh, uh, instructional support and uh, Slowly, um, my, I, I, um, I was promoted into the language center director and worked uh, as language center director, but I also taught all the time. Mm -hmm. And then after that, 
Um, again, mainly due to the experience with IU and the knowledge gained through my MA in ELT program, which was online some, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, now I'm in charge of the quality of teaching and learning at SEU. Yep. And it might be interesting for the audience to hear that at the time when we took, me and some of my colleagues took our online degree with IU, um, online um, learning and teaching was not recognized here. And our professors from the state university would not acknowledge our degree. And uh, they didn't think it was, um, it was corresponding the, the traditional degree on site. Mm -hmm. But uh, now we are all witnessing what's going on and, and now that experience is helping a lot, not only to myself, but to the whole community and the university. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that introduction, because I think one of the things that you raised is, and in and, and this conversation, it's like a roundtable discussion, so anybody can come in and out uh, in terms of the discussion. But one thing that you did bring up is, is that the difference, there is a division between state and private universities in uh, the Republic of North Macedonia. And so you are one of the private universities uh, that, that, that uh, is in the country. And so, and so that's a good distinction for us to know about. Uh, and so uh, if I may use your first names, that, that uh, if sure, you please. each other's first names, that, that would be easier. Easier, so much easier. <laughs> please so, do. Uh, so instead of, uh, so one of the things that I want to pursue with this is I think going to Daniela. Daniela, if you could take up this discussion and talk about uh, quickly about yourself and what is the language situation in Macedonia? It, it is very unique, very multilingual. So if you want to start that off uh, with a quick introduction of who you are and then a description of this multilingual situation in Macedonia. Okay, well, I'm Daniela Kiros Kasimianos, and I've been teaching here at SCU for many, many years, 17, I think, almost. And I've started teaching uh, English language, but now I've kind of moved uh, more into uh, teaching, uh, into using technology in teaching and learning. So I'm teaching also other subjects apart from English language. So I also teach digital and online literacy, which was a new subject that was introduced last semester. And it was proven to be a great success among students at our university. And it was a very nice, um, interesting subject. And I also teach uh, computer assisted language learning, which I overtook from many over here. <laughs> and it's also an interesting subject. And as I told you, I'm mainly interested in technology. And I've learned a lot during this situation uh, while we were having this online teaching. Uh, regarding our situation with the languages and having Macedonia as a multilingual country, uh, well, I can say that. It is a bliss that we are living in such a multilingual society because we have many different languages here which are spoken and our university is uh, the only one, I still think it's the only one that has, uh, that offers studies uh, in three languages. So those are Macedonian, uh, Albanian and English language mm -hmm. and all three languages are used throughout the university in uh, every Spoke, spoken or written communication. And it's a very, very rare uh, situation. Um, if I might just add one thing, uh, a few years ago, I was at a conference in Zagreb and I was describing our university over there and how we function and how we have this multilingual and multicultural setting. Mm -hmm. And they were amazed. And they said, how come that we never heard about this? So how, how do you deal with the situation? How is it that all of you come together? So I am Macedonian. I teach uh, Albanian students, Macedonian students, and we all come together and we understand each other perfectly. And uh, it's a very rare and unique situation which cannot be found uh, anywhere here in the region, I believe. Yeah, they I'm surprised kind of... that you were asked that in Zagreb. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you would think 
something that everybody would know by now, but you you are, so you have three, you have uh, three or more languages. You have Macedonian, you have Albanian, you have Turkish, uh, yeah. you have also other languages that are operating. But the other thing I thought that was unique in SEEU is that students can decide which language they want their education to be in. And so, yeah. Veronica, how do you do that? How, how is that manageable? Um, it's, it, it's a bit complicated, but it works. It is also administratively difficult. And uh, with teaching staff, with qualified staff, but we manage somehow, mainly because almost all the, the, the staff, the teaching academic staff, are um, bilingual or trilingual. And it's amazing how especially native speakers of Albanian could switch among languages. Um, they can speak Macedonian and immediately shift to English, then to Albanian, and it's really amazing. Turkish sometimes. So um, that's why how it functions. Yeah, it's a and gift. It, it brings, <laughs> I have concluded long ago that the more exposed children are to languages from younger age, the better for them is, mm -hmm. and, and then the easier for them is to, to know and, and be fluent with all those languages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really much in favor of introducing more languages at very young age, because it's turned to be efficient with native speakers of Albanian. And I think that's, that's what's happening right now in the educational system in Macedonia. I think they are introducing Albanian language for the Macedonian kids and then Macedonian language for Albanian kids. I'm not so sure about Turkish because that's not the dominant mm, group, but definitely most of the schools do introduce um, Albanian uh, or Macedonian or whichever nationality is learning and then also English. Uh, but there are also options like for French and German. And on top of what's happening in the public schools, we we have something that may not be, uh, you know, common in the United States at all. But we have private language schools where actually kids are signed up for after class or before class, depending on whether they go uh, first or second shift to to school. But they do attend these private classes in addition to what they're doing in schools, which, which also boosts the language um, progress um, for, for these kids from earlier age. I mean, that it is, it is amazing to see kids seven, eight, 10 years old sounding like, almost like native speakers of English because they, they are exposed to the original language when they watch movies, when they listen to music, they attend these additional classes when, when parallelly to what they're doing at school. And maybe not all skills are progressing. You know, after all, we are negotiating, negotiating culture. So the, the speaking comes more naturally to us. You know, there may yes. not be that really right. to develop yeah. at that age. But I mean, definitely you can hear people speaking English. And, and I hope that happens with the other languages as well. But um, initially, there may have been some resistance. I think people are accepting it more and more now. Um, mm -hmm. Because I and I see it through my nephews who are there. They're just like, oh, I have Albanian class or I have German, you know. So they're just talking about it more naturally. So I don't see as much resistance, or I don't hear about it maybe because I'm not there. <laughs> but oh, I oh, think it's interesting, you know, because you have so many languages, so many ethnic groups. You know, I mean, anyone can chime in with this question, but what is the role of English? I mean, what is English doing in the midst of it all? I mean, there's some political issues here as well, but, you know, but there are other issues as well in terms of the English language. So what is this? What is the role of English uh, in, in, I have to say, the Republic of North Macedonia, because that was the name that you were, that, that, you know, that came Politically, about we got it. It's <laughs> <laughs> Be careful, okay? Because you have a Be careful, right? No <laughs> politics here. <laughs> so, but, but, you know, do we say R-O-M or is there a short for, for the Republic? Or just, just the Republic of Macedonia? N-R-M, I think, is the new 
is the new um, the short name of our country, yeah, the, the, the abbreviation, and NRM, yes. NRM, yes, okay. Yes. So okay. going back to the role of English, you know, and you have to tell us too what English, which English, but the role of English, what is it? And anybody can chime in in this question. Well, can I just add something here? I mean, in, in terms of your question, because I have two kids which are at school now, and I might say that, uh, I might, I have to say that English is taking over. So it's kind of a putting aside our local languages and our mother tongues. And kids on the street are talking in English among themselves. And I hear that every time. So they go to, uh, for example, my daughter, she, uh, she goes to these hip hop classes and they talk among themselves in English. Although they, all of them are they sing the songs and they dance and so it's yeah. only the original language. Yeah, yeah. When we were growing up, I feel it was the language of prestige. You know, it was more like you have to, you have to know how to work with computers and you have to know English so you can get a good, it was, it was higher motivation in terms of employment, in terms of progress. Yeah. I'm not so sure. I mean, it, it's, it feels like it's the baseline now, right? And, and so the kids are just, because of all the media, Oh, everything everything on, on the internet is in English that they need. Uh, yeah. We are a small nation, so I don't feel like everything can be translated that fast to meet the needs or whatever, the, be that the students, be that adults, be that kids want or need. So you can't you can access it in your mother tongue, but the English is so vastly accessible. Everything is in English on the internet. Mm -hmm. so, and the there kids are exposed. Yeah, they, they get it. And, and there is one thing I also noticed that uh, when they talk even in Macedonian and they kind of don't, uh, they want to, to say the, the word and it, they don't know the word in Macedonian, they use the English word. <laughs> so they kind of, <laughs> they don't translate it, they just use the English word within the Macedonian sentence and it's done. So okay. And it sounds yeah. natural. Yeah, it does. And it's okay with them. And I go and I English. say, no, 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 you have to use, this is English. the translation, please use the translation. Yeah, because it sounds ugly, you know, when you just put it in the middle of a sentence, but they do that. Yeah, they're trying to communicate, their focus is communication. I mean, yeah. English, yeah. More and I think, I think absolutely that it has the status of being in English as an international language, speaking of TESOL, because I think as um, Amy mentioned earlier, for all of us, when we were, in a, I mean, getting our degrees, it was for the purpose of getting better job prospects. And even now we know, um, I mean, we sometimes joke, but even to get different types of jobs that would not typically require English, for example, shop assistants are required to know English just because mm -hmm. if there are foreigners so that it shows that we are open to people. And I think another reason is that after the country, uh, after Macedonia became independent after uh, the uh, all of the republics from the former Yugoslavia became their own countries. I think there were a lot of different types of foreign investment and that also drove the need to know and uh, be fluent in English. And uh, that all meant that the education had to catch on and uh, the private language schools were blooming and still are. And I think that's the most amazing thing ever. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I think we always, I mean, in our part of the world, we always like the default is at least being bilingual. But it wasn't until I came here in the United States that I really appreciated that. I mean, I knew, I mean, it's like, yeah, sure, I speak English and Macedonian and I could speak Albanian now, maybe I've lost that uh, already. But I think the whole, everyone can do that. It's not just, it's not a, a matter of access. It's not a matter of, oh, people who have the money can do and learn another language. Everyone has a chance to do that through the public schools. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas here, it wasn't until here when I spoke, told people, well, I can speak three languages. They were like, wow, you're so smart. Whereas back home, like, no, I'm not. You know, it's just- <laughs> Nobody what? cares, you know it. <laughs> it's, um, but I, I can really see the benefit of it. And I really, I think, appreciate it much more now that I live and work here in the United States states mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think you know I mean I mean I think what you're describing is a setting whereby the you're born into a setting whereby there, there are multiple languages mm -hmm. and you know and then you 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 
are raised with more than one language. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and so, and, and it was the same for me as well, you know, in my own setting in Malaysia, I mean, we were all raised with more than one language, you know, it's to your benefit to be able to engage that way. Uh, again, the role of I English, you know, because when is, when is English introduced into the system, into the, into the formal education? Or is it, uh, you know, because it has, if I, if I may bring up a little bit in terms of the, the setting that you have, Veronica, you can chime, uh, you can com uh, comment on this, is that, you know, one of the, in SEEU, one of the challenges is to decide which medium of instruction, you know, uh, would be the one used. And then, you know, and English came into play at that point in time. Am I, am I misrepresenting, Veronica? Speaking about SEU, yeah, with, with English, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, at um, schools in Macedonia, English is introduced at very early stage, very early age. It is obligatory from the age of five. Yeah. Now, kindergarten, uh, mm, even before kindergarten, preschool. And yeah, preschool. But the first two years, they just learn it through games, music. They, they, they don't write at all. Um, mm -hmm. At the age of 10, they introduce another second language at schools, which is usually German. Now German is very popular because of the opportunities for employment in Germany uh, and the migration. And then, um, at high school, English is also obligatory. So before coming to universities, um, even children that don't attend private schools would have at least 12 years of English at school. And they are supposed to come with fluent English, with, with good proficiency. But when we test them at uh, entrance, it turns out that those students that come from rural areas and that uh, children who attended only private schools and did not have a chance to attend, uh, sorry, who attended public schools are not so fluent in English. Mm -hmm. And then we have to put them in levels which are low and some of them even start from beginning, from scratch. Mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. so how there's inequities. is it? So there's inequities in, in terms of access to the English. Yes, language. very mixed abilities. Mm -hmm. Still, we have mixed abilities, and that started to change from recently. Maybe from two or three years ago, we are getting better and better students, more fluent in English, and some of them take immediately English for specific purposes. Mm -hmm. But still, there are students who come at SEU at the age of 18 or 19 after 12 years of obligatory English and they're not fluent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's another uh, problem why it is like that, but partly it was due to the fact that we still have at schools traditional um, teaching, uh, teachers from the traditional, from, from former Yugoslavia, that are still teaching according mainly to the grammar through grammar translation method. Mm -hmm. And we'll that, that's that. the biggest we'll get, reason yeah. for, for that. We'll get into that discussion about pedagogy because yes, you know, grammar translation is something that uh, that you know we might touch base on. But one of the things that you have mentioned is that there are factors surrounding the use of English. One is the issue of, and I don't know, I'm just saying this from, from what I know externally. You have the issues of emigration. You know, people use English for that purposes because there's a lot of young people leaving the country. The other is that you have the EU situation and your and membership, right? And English plays a role there. The third is also because there's so many countries, uh, so many groups, and so many languages in in Macedonia. English does English become a lingua franca uh, in terms of uh, you know. Uh, in terms of all of that, and then language is English is a language um, for better or for worse for higher education, access to higher education. Yeah. So those are am I am am I 
touching base on the right on the factors you think that exactly, are exactly yes and and one of the reasons why our university is popular is because of the english because it's it's really um it's really not good for the country but we are attracting students because through the language and the focus on languages and skills we are preparing our students for for abroad mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and our students unfortunately leave the country yeah, a lot teachers too yeah. <laughs> yes <laughs> Well, it's it's a you know the the world we live in is very globalized, right? <laughs> I mean, look at look at us, and the three of us here are from elsewhere, and we're all English language teachers. I mean, the reality yeah. of it is, I think I'm and going to say that's the George, reality. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm going to say George Brain here that says you know who said eighty percent of teachers who teach English are non-native speakers of English, and we're all. Mm -hmm testaments of that you know of that <laughs> reality <laughs> and so, so teach it, teach it in, in an in a english-speaking country too so <laughs> that's true <laughs> and so you know uh, anything else to add so that we understand the macro picture of Ma english in macedonia as well as you know the the set the language setting in macedonia yeah i just want to add the role of the pop culture in any of the local languages because i think i mean as a language learner, even I think being exposed to uh, movies that were dubbed in English, um, or I mean, they were not they were not dubbed in Macedonian, but they were rather the, there was a translation at the bottom of the screen, and we were exposed to different types of English. I think that's another reason, and also our own I think openness to pop culture from the neighboring countries, listening to different types of music, being exposed to different types of art from the neighboring countries, also contributed to being multilingual uh, and more open to these languages. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, also plays a huge role. I know that in other countries, and especially here, you cannot, you know, when you listen to the cable TV, you maybe can listen to Spanish. There are no other languages unless you have some special prescription to subscription to listen to other um, mm -hmm. TV channels that are in some of the other languages. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And also, and I would I would like to to add because uh, Farida, you mentioned which English. And it's very interesting because in our schools, we use uh, books from British publishers. Mm -hmm. We use Oxford, Cambridge. We don't have American providers. And yet our students speak American English. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't explain that. It's, it's Hollywood. Strange. It's Hollywood, Rinta. It's, it's Hollywood. It's, That's it's what not you because get. of the books. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they don't learn English from books. No. We always have Oxford, Cambridge. We have Longman. They're all British. They're all UK. And then they, our students would say, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and we don't teach them that. Yeah. Popular culture, yeah. But one, the, the other thing too, you know, the internet and, and the other thing too, I think just citing Higgins is the ownership of English has expanded beyond, you know, the inner circle countries. And so I'm sure there's, you know, Macedonian English, Albanian English, and, you know, all those types of things. And so, which makes it very, a very interesting world. Englishes. We live in the world of Englishes, not in, in, in not just one English. exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. like inter international English. So yeah. <laughs> but like you said, the main the main purpose is communication. So be that if you insert a word here or there, or be that yeah. you know you speak with a different accent, who cares as long as the message is conveyed? Yeah. I also Absolutely. wanted to add that at SEU, what I really loved in terms of the structure, that there were people when they were placed uh, in the different levels, in addition to being placed to four levels, they had a, then the people who were maybe higher, uh, more proficient, they could either be placed in an English for academic purposes or English for specific purposes. And then all of us had uh, a specific specialty. For example, I used to teach mm -hmm. English for specific purposes for computer science students. And I mean, we know how hard it is to teach ESP because we know that no matter how much you, what kind of materials you get, the field develops much more quickly than they're able to produce those types of books. And I think being even able to provide 
EAP, English for Academics Purposes, and ESP to more proficient students was very, very beneficial for, to those students. And we also noticed that for those students, maybe their spoken English was great. Maybe their Bix versus Kelp was the Bix was really good, but then the, 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 the academic English was missing. So that's why the focus on the ESP and the EAP courses was on developing their academic and their writing specific to their um, discipline. Yeah. And I think that uh, that also contributes to um, the success of the students who are a part of the SEU um, mm -hmm. community. So in, in, do you do content-based instruction or e English medium instruction in SEU? Or do you do, you have language instruction separately from content instruction? Separate. We do have separately, apart from the study programs that are uh, run in English. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the time being, we have three or four study programs in English, mm -hmm. um, international communication, then English language teaching, of course, and we have business informatics. Mm -hmm. And so they're, for, they're, for, those, yeah. Yeah, for those programs, English is the language of instruction. And for all other students, no matter what they study, they attend English courses. Those that are tested out of the program, they take academic writing, academic English, uh, but ESP is obligatory for all of them. Because there are five faculties and uh, five ESPs for law, for business, for computer sciences, for communication sciences, and for public uh, management and administration. And the oh, beauty yeah. of it too is also, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, mm. For example, if someone is taking English for academic purposes, there could be a student who, whose major is business or there is a student whose major is public administration. So those English classes were maybe the only place other than the cafeteria where these students from the different majors or from the different schools would come together and socialize and expand their networks. And uh, I mean, to me, that's priceless. Exactly. Sorry, I, I muted myself. <laughs> so, you know, believe it or not, we've been talking for about half an hour. See how rich this discussion is and we could go on forever. So uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, it, again, everyone chime in, this is a round table discussion and I can kind of see that people are watching us on, on Facebook Live. Uh, and so this, your session is really uh, inviting quite a bit of interest. Um, in terms of the research, let's get to the research that, um, that Zakeri Kareva and Alia, or Ali, Alia, is that correct, uh, did. And, and I think one of the things that came up from that study is, you know, going back to the pedagogical approach that you were mentioning, Veronica, is, is in a sense that, um, you know, one of the concerns that brought about that paper was, was the pedagogical approach in terms of face-to-face. You know, and I think one of the things that you mentioned in the paper was that lectures dominated the pedagogy of uh, instruction uh, in, in face to face. And I think what the paper is suggesting is that students preferred the online medium because it, it did not stay in the lecture mode. Uh, it's perhaps is, is, is more interactive. Am I not in, interpreting that right? What would you say, Veronica, as to why there, there would seem to be a preference uh, to online instruction in that paper? You're interpreting it correctly because in Macedonia, with the professional um, courses teachers, like professional, I mean um, teachers, professors of courses like law or business, or public administration, um, they are not um, so much knowledgeable about teaching, about methodology. There is no requirement that they attend a course or a program that will prepare them for teaching. And with, with us, unfortunately, um, it means literally that any expert can teach. If you are an, an expert in law, that would automatically make you a good teacher. And of course it is not correct. 
and um, most of the teaching in the traditional classroom is still ex cathedra. Professors lecture, they, they present their PowerPoint presentations, then they, they ask questions, they self answer the questions, and of course, students are not so much interested in that. Mm -hmm. While with the online mode, there is more interaction in terms of professors try to pose um, questions, to organize discussion forums. They can express their opinions in a better way, something that they do not do in their regular mm -hmm. um, on-site teaching. So, so you're saying that the online medium is actually changing the pedagogy of instruction instead of just lecturing. The professors now are, because of the way the online medium is set up, um, you know, they have to make it interactive, right? They or have they, to they make have it. To, they have to make it more, of, take a more inquiry approach to instruction uh, for better or for worse. <laughs> so uh, obviously it's better. Are they, are they mandated to follow a specific structure when they're teaching online as they were before or not really? Um, we, we are pushing them to, to use, first of all, more elements um, to, to assess, to evaluate students. And automatically it requires more interaction and more feedback to students. Mm -hmm. Because when they teach in a traditional way, they rely their grades mostly on exams, on tests. Occasionally, they would have a seminar paper or project, but with online teaching and with the, with the rapid move to online mode, they, they couldn't rely that much on, on, on those exams because they were not ready to, to give exams online. They could not, not transfer the assessment online. And then they were forced to, to look for ways to become more interactive with their students. And that was the biggest reason why, why students liked it better. And I guess because you can trace the interaction you know, online because it becomes more visible. And I, I suppose, I don't know whether, whether um, uh, Daniela, this is something that you're using in your classes in the sense that you can trace students' interactions. You can use that as part of assessment. Is that something that's happening in your classroom? I mean, you've you wrote that paper on the, the, uh, on the quality of online teaching. Is that, is that something that, that, that's become part of the assessment, the interaction? Okay. The paper is uh, written by Veronica. I'm just the co-author of the paper. She's the main author about the quality. Well, tracing of interaction in terms of, um, you mean doing the online class, like we're having a class now, or in terms of uh, the class uh, itself throughout the whole semester? Right. Well, my, my question is, I think Veronica uh, mentioned that you know, in the past, you can the pedagogy has always been one way in the sense that you give the lecture, students take the test. But now, because of the online medium, uh, teachers are forced to kind of make it more inquiry based because you know that that is the mode that that they operate in. And so, have you used that mode and and the ability to trace students' interactions as part of your assessment? Yeah, well, as, as Veronica said, we, all of us were uh, kind of forced to use uh, Google Classroom and we also used Google Meet for our online classes. Mm -hmm. And of course it proved, uh, I think most of us will share, all of us who thought will share the same opinion that it proved to be very, very nice uh, learning uh, management system for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, because we were able to trace what the students did and how they did it and we were able to give them feedback even in real time through scheduling different uh, office hours and talk to students in person uh, face to face even in an online uh, mode but it offered kind of a uh, let me say different experience for all of us which was positive at least for me so I got to understand everyone um, I mean I was able to, to trace all of the students assignments and uh, give them feedback and then uh, um, 
Did you guys do discussions? Like, uh, were you able to <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, while I was talking, I was <laughs> trying to remember what we did. <laughs> so sorry for that. Uh, I was trying to remember what, what we were doing throughout the semester. So <laughs> as you were just said, uh, we were having different modes of assessment. So various, various methods of assessment. So we use discussion forums. Um, I've used debate, which I've organized for the first time uh, online. <laughs> and it was very, very interesting for me. Uh, we have used, um, um, well, at least I've used uh, uh, things that students, uh, I kind of relied more on things that students do on their own. So I was teaching them, part of uh, the class was teaching, and then they were left alone, and they had to do all this research alone and come back with something that they did. So they were supposed to do different uh, uh, projects. Uh, they were supposed to do different uh, video projects, persuasive speeches, uh, presentations. So I put a lot of emphasis on their own work. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it proved to be very, very challenging for them. Mm -hmm. But at uh, the same way, they were also very interested. And I th think that they learned a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're really, I think the, 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 the medium, you know, you've really shifted the pedagogy organically. And <laughs> the, 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 the challenge, I, I think, just reading the two papers, one of the things, I'm, I'm going to take the devil's advocate perspective here, one of the things that, that I, I was very concerned about, or somebody might be concerned about, is that those who are reporting that they like online education, you know, are the ones with the higher GPA. Mm -hmm. And so I, then the question that comes to mind is that are these students okay whether they're online on site, you know, they can do it on their own or without, you know, without anybody's help. Is, is that something that is, is that, is that something that, that, that has, uh, a, is that a possibility or am I misreading the, uh, misinterpreting the results here? Your interpretation is, is correct, but we have to make clear to the audience that there is a big difference between English teachers and content area teachers. So what English teachers do, what language teachers do in general, not just English, Albanian and Macedonian teachers uh, the same following the English teaching methodology uh, is not um, followed uh, by content area teachers. They are trying, they are doing their best, but they, 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 they cannot keep the pace with, with English teachers. And um, my reasoning is that um, students like it more the way that they get autonomy when they are taught online, but by the content area teachers. They are left more on their own. And, and in the classroom, in the traditional classroom, they're more guided by the professors. Mm -hmm. With the online mode, they're more autonomous and that's why they, they like it better. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bit contradictory because we made, uh, the research shows that they are satisfied with the online teaching and that they like it. But before um, the school year started, because before the academic year started, we, we, we did a survey through which we ask students whether they would prefer to be taught online or on site. And they 56% said that they would like to come to camp campus. So um, we believe that the reason for that is the fact that our campus is beautiful and because um, they, they miss their social life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Verce, I will add, it's not just uh, SEU students, I think everywhere, they did a similar survey here at USI, so, yeah, and uh, that is why we, we actually offer here all three modes, in-person, face-to-face, um, uh, face uh, hybrid, and completely online. And we have students who are taking all online classes, and yet they're here every day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's uh, definitely that social element that's missing. Sure, sure. But it's interesting, though. It's only 56%. The other 44% prefer to stay online, which is quite
quite a revelation because, you know, there is a strong contingent there, a big contingent who want to stay and prefer to be online. And so it speaks in terms of what this online medium is doing. Uh, I, I think as we proceed, one of the things that you've raised also is the idea is, is and I think both uh, Veronica and Daniela, your paper is, is, although it's in the early stage, you're kind of looking at uh, teacher, you, you looking at now the teachers, right? And perhaps you're going in that direction. I know it's early in the research, but what are the competencies that teachers are saying they need to develop now in this day and age because of this online instruction? Or what do they feel their professional development needs are at this point? I mean, we know it's technology, but you know, but what is it that they want pedagogically or otherwise? First, as, as you say, it was technology. It was more support in terms of technology. Um, majority of them used um, Google Meet for the first time. And they, they, from simple things, they didn't know how to record, how to switch on cameras, how to, um, how to observe the students. But for us, it was not so difficult because we somehow used uh, the learning management systems since long ago. We used to have your uh, learning management system, Angel, Amy was there to develop it. Then we moved to an institutional learning management system, the one that was called Libri. And now we are using the Google uh, Classroom platform. So all the time we had a kind of a blended mode because um, we, we did teach on, on site, but we would have all the materials in parallel online. Mm -hmm. So what we did with the shift to online mode was only Google Meet. The classroom teaching was transferred on Google Meet and mainly they needed technological support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then um, some of them also needed um, some kind of instruction how to promote online interaction with students, mm -hmm. how they can activate students more how they could um, provide additional uh, exercises to students, which they could do on their own, how to promote autonomous learning, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. how to um, do online assessment, which mm -hmm. is different than test or a quiz on Google Classroom. So they needed more guidelines, guidelines in, in, in that direction. So it's interesting because, you know, it's, yes, technology is one thing, but, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, the, the, the teachers, and we call them trans classroom teachers because we are in both worlds now. So what you're saying is that Macedonian uh, teachers were already there. They were already in both modes, but now with the pandemic, what they're looking for are more how to motivate students how to create interactive activities online. And so, so in a sense, they're in the second tier of, of uh, you know, not the first one, but, but we need to know what technology is because they were already there, but they really are in the second tier of, of pedagogically. They're looking for pedagogical approaches as to how to do this online effectively. Would you say that to be the case, Daniela? Oh, well, yeah, if I remember correctly, during the online training that we had uh, in August and you were presenting there, most of the questions were towards how do we motivate students more in this online world? Mm -hmm. What do we do to keep their attention and to motivate them to learn more? Because at the beginning, and I believe that all of us face the same thing, you log in, you try to have an online class for the first time and there is an empty screen. So there is no video, nothing there, just names of the students. And I, at the beginning I was teaching to an empty screen and it's kind of a, you know, it doesn't feel right. So uh, what at the beginning, what I was doing was calling out their names. Are you here? Are you here? And <laughs> yeah. I've, yeah, I felt miserable, to be honest. And then I had to go and think through everything and uh, find a way how to make all of this work and make them more 
engaged and make them want to come to class and actually do something and learn something. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And I believe most of us were caught in this situation and we just tried to do most uh, the, the most that we, we can do. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so not everyone has the same set of skills. So some of the professors needed more time some of um, the other professors may not, may not need the, the same time, the same amount of time, but the point is that we all need to find a way how to motivate these students and make them uh, want to come to class and learn something. Stay engaged, so, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, there have been reports like after, you know, after two weeks, a lot of people drop out. <laughs> don't stay. A lot of students don't stay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think with the few minutes that we have, what happened in March? Tell us what, how you coped, what happened and how you coped in March going online. What did you do? I mean, what was that like? Is it in March <laughs> that all this happened? Yeah, in March, uh, we, we are teaching normally. We are in classrooms. We come home and there is a press release that with the governmental decision, universities are closed. Yeah, for two and weeks. Yes. It was initially for two weeks only. For two, they announced for two weeks, but it happened today. And uh, with SEU, with our university, uh, we were immediately online. The other day, we were on Google Classroom, all of us. We started receiving from our e-learning center video instructions about how to use Google Meet, um, then the first two weeks were messy, but as the time uh, went on, we were more and more skilled in that. But with the other schools and other universities, for maybe Daniela would know better because her children attend primary school, complete collapse. Nothing happens for some time and then occasionally teachers, individual teachers in public schools started doing something on their own and, and that was uh, varied. Uh, it ranged from uh, bombarding students with materials to people that were completely inactive, then poor parents didn't know what to do, and then it really took some time, maybe a month or so, until they somehow got better and, and got some instructions from the state level. And uh, I don't know, now they, it, it is still a mess. And in the meantime, there were governmental elections. The Ministry for Education did not function. And that's why we are late. I mean, uh, public education is still not open, but private universities and SEU is among, uh, among them, we, we are doing better. But it's not the case. Only SEU made a difference. And uh, one department of the state university, um, the faculty Finki, the computer faculty. But all other um, institutions literally collapsed. So right now, and that's why the start of the new semester is not yet determined because the state is trying to figure out what to do next and it's in the exactly. process of doing so. So in, in the few minutes that we have, um, what are, you know, I've been the one asking questions. What are the things I didn't ask? What are the things that you think, you know, the, these TESOL, you know, teachers and teacher educators that we could benefit from knowing in terms of, you know, language teacher education uh, at this point in time, in terms of your research at this point in time. Uh, if you just chime in, and in terms of your perspectives, Emmy and Vesna being, you know, you have an outside perspective now into what's happening in your own in previous institution. Jump in, anyone. Well, I can start. Uh, for me, I think uh, with the, with the, the COVID-19 conditions, I think what I've learned is that I'm, uh, more willing to open things that I have seen that work as a participant uh, than if it is something that is presented or that I read by myself. But if I was experiencing a tool, what, no matter what that was, and if I was going through the stages, 
I will, I'm more willing to do that. And I've also noticed that sometimes uh, with our willingness or not to use some of these uh, new technologies that for some of us are completely new, some people may have been using them. I think it's a matter of, uh, it's sometimes it's an issue with our us and not the students. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the students are more comfortable. I mean, mo I think most of us here are digital immigrants and uh, we all learn how to use computers when as adults, whereas We're I think still learning. now, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, uh, the kids now are more open and are more <laughs> proficient with using technology. And I think we need to be aware of that and uh, be more open to challenging them so that they're not only using a new tool, but that they're using it to improve their learning and uh, their uh, educational experiences. Mm -hmm. My son had picture day the other day and he's, he's like, I'm going to do a zoom outfit. Um, so <laughs> how, how what the adults are doing is affecting the younger ones. So he went to school with a dress shirt and shorts. <laughs> and uh, I guess that was the, the it everybody was like that and to me that was interesting to observe how this situation basically is affecting everybody they are in in person but the schools here had to navigate like well what if somebody's positive what do you do and then do you switch them to virtual setting do you switch them to completely online like how how to navigate this whole situation and i think i think um this situation only taught us that you know pretty much all you need is a computer and maybe a phone. You can even put your phone on your computer. Mm -hmm. So really computer and internet, it's all you need to connect with people, to, to do your classes, to do your education. And then it's really finding patience, a lot of patience and, and time to, to give yourself as an instructor time and then um, bring in your students into, into that adjust I guess I don't know in mm -hmm. lack of better words, but really yeah. trying to figure out what is the best to do in that particular situation and how to use the resources that you have and how to deal with the kids who don't have the resources. Right, right. right. So uh, thank you. I mean, those are insights both as a parent and as an <laughs> educator, dual language educator. Veronica and uh, Daniela, anything you want to say that we've not asked about North Macedonia? Besides that, it's a great, great country, it covers pretty much everything. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite interesting because, you know, your country, North Macedonia, is a relatively new country. You've gone through so many political changes, you've gone through a war or two, <laughs> you've gone through changes in names. Yeah. Right, you've had to make decisions as to whether or not you're, you know, you're going into the EU and, you know, and uh, making a decision also, what is your main language or languages, all those types of things. I mean, you, I, I think the country is going through an incredible change, including as to who is in Macedonia at this point, the demographics are changing rapidly. So I think we're, thank you though, for, for joining us and, and giving us that insight because um, for those of, of uh, for, for in terms of Macedonia, it's north of Greece and, you know, it's a land, it's, it's, uh, when you tell people where North Macedonia is, what do you, what do you tell people? Um, <laughs> Greece, north of Greece, south of Serbia, somewhere in the mid of Europe. So uh, geographically, it's perfectly located because when you are in Macedonia, you can in an hour go to Italy, Germany, Austria, Turkey, and it's a nice country. It's, it's good for living, beautiful. Um, beautiful. And uh, English has always been the light point in, in the brightest point in the country. It has been seen as a, as a, a way of prosperity, of progress, and it has always been considered like that. Thank you. That's a wonderful way to end this conversation. So I'm going to stop our recording. And I sent you a Zoom link that you can meet up to catch up and talk some more with or without me. But I just want to say thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, in Facebook Live. I saw names popping up, those who are observing us. 
And so thank you very much for your time. You've opened our eyes and our understanding in, in, in very new ways. Thank you again. Thank you for the invitation. Thank Bye. you. Have a great Bye. day. Bye. Bye.